Namaskar, I'm Professor Devdi Purkayasta from the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. Welcome to my course, Business Fundamental for Entrepreneurs, Part 1, Internal Operations. As part of the course, I'm very happy to welcome a very illustrious guest, Professor Rajan Jaswa, to tell us and share with us a few of his experiences and learnings. Before I hand over to Professor Raj Jaswa, a couple of lines of introduction. Professor Raj Jaswa passed out of IIT Bombay for his undergraduate in 1975. He went on to do his master's in electrical engineering from the University of Toronto and then he went on to do his MBA from Stetson University. He went to, to become a serial entrepreneur. And he actually founded three companies in different capacities. And one of the companies went public with a huge multi-billion dollar valuation. He also volunteered to serve on Thai, which is one of the largest network of Indian entrepreneurs across the world. And he served as the president of the Thai chapter in Silicon Valley. And then he went on to become a global trustee. He is also an adjunct faculty at IIT Bombay's own School of Entrepreneurship. And he has been teaching, mentoring, and stimulating entrepreneurial student for the last seven to eight years. So it is my pleasure now to hand over to Professor Raj Jaswa for his module. Hi students and future entrepreneurs. I'm so happy that I've been invited to be a guest speaker on this Business Fundamentals for Entrepreneurs course. Entrepreneurship course is something that we started here in 2014 at IIT Bombay. And we had the dream that one day all students, aspiring entrepreneurs, would have a chance to learn the fundamentals of entrepreneurship uh, from what we are teaching at IIT Bombay. So we started this program in 2014, and it's almost 10 years now, a decade, and now we are ready to take all our entrepreneurship material and get it to students across India and hopefully one day across the globe. So let's, uh, today I've got, I've been given a very interesting topic. I'm just, for me, this is a natural, which is how did I make my journey from just an engineer to an entrepreneur? Now, you would say that IIT engineer is a very special thing. You know, it's a special entrepreneurship, special engineering degree. And yes, IIT engineers are regarded as the creme de la creme, uh, you know, across the globe today as, you know, the most wanted engineers um, anywhere in the globe by any team. So, but the opportunity for an engineer, IIT engineer, or any engineer to move on to becoming an entrepreneur is a privilege. And uh, you will see that, you know, once I made the leap from being an engineer working for the best companies in the world, General Electric Corporation, Intel Corporation, uh, when I made the transition or the jump or took the plunge, to become an entrepreneur, there was no going back. I would never, ever want to go back to just being an individual contributor in, in, uh, you know, for, uh, for any company. Now I wanted my ideas and my vision to take life. And that's what 
drives uh, entrepreneurs to have their idea, their vision take life and start helping people do their job better, live better, uh, solve their problems better. So that's what uh, motivates an entrepreneur. And uh, it took me almost 15 years to take the plunge, to jump. So let's take a look at, you know, why did it take me so long when it is it's so rewarding to be an entrepreneur? And uh, let's then see, like, what is it that holds people back? What held me back in my journey to becoming, going from an engineer to an entrepreneur? So... Uh, basically, I'm going to talk about a little bit about my story and tell you how over the last 40 years I, I've transitioned from being an engineer at some of the best corporations in the world to then becoming an entrepreneur for 25 years and then uh, share with you kind of the journey. What does it take to prepare in order to be a successful entrepreneur, somebody that can actually build companies that take a life beyond them, right? So the whole goal of entrepreneurship is to start, is to develop a com come up with a company, and that let let that company, which is your creation, ha take a life of its own, right? So we are going to talk about four important things, four important things that every entrepreneur when you have the luxury of having somebody else, of working for somebody else, what, is, what are the four things that you need to uh, pull together or the skill set that you need to develop? So we're going to talk about the hard skills. You know, what are the hard skills that you need to develop that are going to be absolutely essential for you as you pr uh, pro progress on your entrepreneurship journey? What are the soft skills? How do you make it easy for people to do business with you? How do you make it, how do you make yourself somebody that people want to do business with you? The art of the deal. So how, what are the soft skills? And then we are going to talk about how do you become the master of what of your market, the, mar the niche market that you want to go ahead and bring brilliant solutions to. So we're going to talk about how you become a craftsman focused on getting that pot designed perfectly right, right? So you, how do you become that craftsman? And then finally, you know, it's a one-way journey. Once you jump and take the plunge, you can't jump back. There is no looking back once you take the plunge. And we will talk about the challenges and then we'll talk about, about how do you take the plunge and be excited about being on the journey to being an entrepreneur. Okay, so what's my story? Um, essentially, IIT is hard to get into, did a lot of preparation, did my Agarwal classes. We all have to study beyond our normal curriculum in order to become uh, be invited to be an engineer uh, who's going to be educated by the great IITs of India. And IIT Bombay is one of the premier, premier IITs also. So got my BTEC in electrical engineering in 1975. And then decided that, you know, I needed to get a little bit more specialization and some more advanced education and picked up a master's in EE at University of Toronto in Canada. And uh, a few years later, then I started working at GE, and concurrently, I decided to get an MBA because I decided that you know I wanted to be more than just an engineering contributor in the companies that I worked for. I wanted to get the business side of it under my belt, so I picked up an MBA, and GE generously funded my MBA education, which was pretty nice. So I was a design engineer at GE and picked up an MBA at the same time. Uh, with my MBA in my, under my belt, I was ready to um, move into marketing. And I got, in, I got a job at Intel Corporation in California. 
and I was a product manager for some of Intel's microprocessors for the next six, seven years. Uh, then worked at a small company called Chips and Technologies that I'll share with you in my journey as to what can you learn at a big company, what can you learn at a medium size and a smaller company. Uh, small companies will give you a lot more well-rounded experience because remember, as an entrepreneur, you're starting from a small, small, small company, right? So you need to know what it takes for a small company to come together. And then, you know, took the plunge. And from being just an individual contributor, even at the managerial level, moved on to starting the first company called Opti, a semiconductor company. Just four of us, no experience starting a company, no ed formal education in entrepreneurship that all of you are getting, and we just jumped in. So many things we did not know, and uh, you know, we obviously did it better in our future companies, but this company, what we did have is a lot of excitement and energy because you know, there was so much new learning about what it meant to start your own company and run your own business. So we ran Opti for seven years, we took it public. Imagine starting a company with no funding and taking it public four years later for a $400 million valuation and becoming the largest chipset vendor in the whole world in a span of four or five years. And one out of every four personal computers used our chips. And that was a heck of an achievement. And I'll tell you what kind of skill set it took in order to get there. Then after seven years, you know, maybe uh, time to try something new. Internet was coming along, Java was coming along, the world was excited about this new, new disruptive technology called the internet, and uh, you know, met this IIT Kanpur student, and we started Selectica. And uh, Selectica was an AI startup. AI is the buzzword today. Uh, 20 years later, but we were one of the earliest AI companies, and uh, we started Selectica, and you know we basically built it up to be a very significant company in the AI business software, business intelligence area uh, on the internet platform, and you know took it public for five billion dollars, ten times more value than Opti and took it, you know, to take it public for $5 billion uh, in that day and age is probably equivalent to taking a company public for $50 billion today. Um, you know, so heck of a success. We were regarded as the white hot startup of the day. So that was a heck of a run. Ran that for seven years and then uh, became the president of Thai for four years and then got back into entrepreneurship and started a video streaming company called Dino. Ran that for five years. And then I decided that, you know, time to start teaching students across the, in India, first, first in the US and then in India, what is this entrepreneurship all about? Is it really just black magic? Is it something that just happens by luck? Or is it something that can be taught and clearly Right now, we feel that entrepreneurship is something that can be taught. And uh, at IIT Bombay, we experimented and we tried so many things. And I believe right now we have put together a phenomenally effective uh, teaching program, experiential teaching program to help shape the next generation of entrepreneurs as uh, very, very, uh, right off the bat. And uh, we've been doing that for nine years. And so, you know, from being an engineer at IIT Bombay, full circle round, to back to IIT Bombay, but now I'm on the stage at IIT Bombay and I'm teaching the next generation of students entrepreneurship. And now through this NPTEL platform, hope to have, you know, tens of thousands. And as I hear, you know, the expectation is maybe hundreds of thousands of students will get educated in entrepreneurship using the 
IIT Bombay NPTEL entrepreneurship programs. Okay, so what does it take? How do you prepare? What are the hard skills that are needed? And when I think back, I think the number one thing that you need to become is an inveterate problem solver. As an entrepreneur, you face problems of all types, small problems, large problems, different kinds of problems, business problems, engineering problems, customer service problems, all kinds of problems is what you face. You are a problem solver. But at, as an engineer or somebody who is going to school, what should you do? How do you become a problem solver? How do you become a person who can solve problems night and day and not get exhausted solving problems? Uh, the reason why I say this is because as an entrepreneur, believe it or not, you'll be solving problems night and day. So you better love the job of solving problems night and day. So what can we do when we are at school? I would say the number one thing is be the best engineer you can be. And the best engineer is somebody that not only goes to class and studies the theory, but also tries to put those learnings into practice, you know, go to the lab, go uh, after the classes are over, go to the lab, think of things that you can make with all the education that you've got or the academics that you've got, make something out of it, you know, fool around with all the equipment that is there in la laboratories and other incubators and so on, and be the best engineer you can be. The reason why I'm saying is that be the best engineer that you can be uh, at a school during your school days is that guess what? Learning to be the best engineer is actually a luxury. It is not work. <laughs> it is an opportunity. It is not something that you work that you have to do because the professor gave you an assignment. It is something that turns you on because it's a luxury. You are privileged with all the resources and all the hopes of the country that you will design great products for your companies and then ultimately for your own company. And this is the time for you to be the best engineer that you can be. Learn to be the best engineer that you can be. While you're learning to be the best engineer, you have to learn to think out of the box. Because, you know, when you go into the real world, the professor who gave you the assignment to do did not have the answer already figured out. When you go into the real world, you'll find that for every problem, there are a n number of solutions. And any of them will do the job, but the question is, which one will do the job right from a business angle? Not which one will do the job right from just a technical angle or just from cost angle or whatever, but from the total business angle. So you have to learn to think out of the box when you face any problem. And this is something that you want to experiment and practice while you're at your engineering school or in your other university. And uh, essentially, you know, all of us are one-track-minded people. So we can think this is the only way to solve this problem. But you find five people and tell them, how would you solve this problem? And you'll find that five people actually figure out five different ways to solve the same problem. And then you learn that, you know, any problem actually has n number of solutions. And just because you thought of one way to do it is not the only way to do it. And so learn to think out of the box. And then how do you develop this personality that attracts problems? <laughs> you want to have a personality that attracts problems. And the reason why you want to attract problems is so that you can solve them because you love, like there are people who love doing crossword puzzles. And 
you, some people, it's a lot of work. But for the person who loves crossword puzzles, it's joy, it's happiness, it's, uh, it's satisfaction. So the same way, uh, we have to figure out how to attract problems. And how do you attract problems? Volunteer for open-ended assignments. Uh, organize different events. Organize field trips. Organize uh, competitions. Org you know, so volunteer for open-ended assignments. Things that will, where the budget is not set, the team size is not set, the opportunity is not defined, but open-ended so that you, re because that is how the real world is. It's an open-ended world. It's not a closed-end world where somebody says, okay, solve this problem and boom, you are going to build a successful company. No, the world is, entrepreneur's world is open-ended and they, how they attack the problem, how the solution com comes together is basically what will define the parameters of your company. So basically, pick up open-ended assignments because you will decide and you will come up with, oh, this should be the framework of, the, this, of, the, uh, of that particular challenge that you took up. The next thing is that you, an inveterate problem solver does is that they learn that resources can come from everywhere and anywhere. And, you know, if they need money to get something done, they can get it through the uh, institute, they can get it from the department, they can get it from their parents, they can get it from their friends, they can get it from uh, different institutions, n number of places to essentially get resources, whether it's money resources, I told you about all these different ways, people resources, equipment resources, promotional resources, all kinds of resources are available from so many sources. And the question is, you have to figure out what is the right combination of resources to put together to solve your open-ended assignment by thinking out of the box and doing the right kind of engineering, right? So, you ha and finally, remember, you have to enjoy this because tomorrow there's gonna be an another problem. Later on, there's gonna be another problem. I mean, the problems never stop. And if you don't become an inveterate problem solver while you're a student at your institute, it's going to be hard for you to go ahead and, uh, and become an entrepreneur and you're going to be exhausted. Instead of getting energy from solving the problems and looking forward to the next problem to solve and having this continuous feeding of energy from solving problems, it'll start draining you out. And entrepreneurs that are drained out <laughs> don't last too long as an entrepreneur. So first thing, in my opinion, is develop the hard skills to make you an inveterate problem solver. Then you find out that, you know, those hard skills don't really make you successful by themselves. They are just the foundation. Ultimately, in order to build a company, in order to get a, a purchase order, in order to raise money, in order to do that, you have to do something called close the deal. And you've got to learn the art of the deal. What does it take to get a deal closed, right? So clearly, things to be learned. What are the key tools? There are, co there are sales, sales skills have to be developed, sales techniques have to be learned, marketing skills have to be developed, marketing technology and nomenclature and all of these things have to be learned. Negotiations, you know, soon you'll realize that every transaction is actually negotiable. What you get depends on how good a negotiator you are. And then you've got to learn money. Money is what makes the world go around. Sad to say that, as you know, you thought money came from your parents and they will, and obviously they took really good care of you so that you got admission to all these schools and you don't have to worry about who pays for your uh, tuition or who pays for your lord, uh, uh, lodging or boarding, etc. 
But in the real world, you are responsible to raise money from strangers. Now you need to know everything about money. So learning everything about money becomes very, very important. So lots of soft skills have to be developed. Soft skills in the area of sales, marketing, negotiations, finance, on and on and on. All the MBA courses that you see uh, online as well as, uh, as, as well as through an MBA program, all of these skills have to be, soft skills have to be learned. And then you find that, you know, if you are just quiet about how good you are, <laughs> you are going to be ignored. You won't get, you, 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 you're just going to be left behind in the dust. You realize that if you are going to go ahead and uh, be successful in life, you better communicate to everybody as to how good you are, how good your idea is, how successful you're going to be and deliver. And of course, the communication skills, the effective presentation, the debating, you'll find that everything requires a back and forth. And then you come up with the right answer and convince the other person. So debating skills, presentation skills, convincing skills, all these communication skills start becoming very important in order to get your deal to become something that is interesting to, to, to whoever you want to do transaction with, whether it is customers, whether it is investors, whether it is bankers, whether it is lawyers, whether it is investment bankers, whether it is, you know, it's all of them you have to do presentation. And then you find that, you know, some or the other, everybody likes the way I sell it, promote it, present it, etc. But nobody signs on the deal. Nobody hands over the money. And the reason is there is something missing. And that something missing is called emotional quotient or EQ. You are not credible. You are not trustworthy. Oh my God, how do I get other people to trust me with their million dollars? How do I get... I had to, when we raised a Selectic, did a Selectic IPO, I had to convince investors that my company was worth $5 billion. How do I get them to trust me with their money and their future uh, and, and, you know, their personal savings and to get them to buy my stock? So EQ is something that you have to learn to develop. And then finally realize that the king is not your great company. The king is the customer for your products and services, right? So you have to have the humility to realize no matter how great a mousetrap you design, how great a product you design, unless the customer, you treat the customer uh, like a king, you know, with humility, with, with care, with, uh, uh, you know, not gonna succeed. So out of the deal is very important. And finally, <clears throat> you suddenly realize that, boy, you know, you've developed the hard skills, you've got the soft skills. Now what? You have to become like a craftsman and generate focus, be focused on one small niche where you are going to be the best. The important thing in life is to be the best. It's up to you to decide whether you're gonna be best on a big market or a small market or whatever market you want, but you have to be the best at what you do. And uh, you know, the world of business is, in a, is always in a state of change and flux. Technology can be disruptive, it can be your friend or your enemy. Competition, if you're making a lot of money, Competition wants to come and is sniffing at you, sniffing in your tail, down your back. So competition is always learning. Then you realize that the people working for you, people who are your partners, people who are your customers, they are not robots. They are continuously changing. They are continuously learning. And then you realize that, you know, the customer was happy last year with this performance, but today you want something 30% faster. Their needs are continuously evolving. They want more features. 
soon you realize that you cannot rest on your laurels. You cannot rest on your success. Change is the only constant in business. And you have to be comfortable with a world that continuously changes under you. And an entrepreneur, by focusing on a niche market where he is the best in terms of all the functionality, all the capability, he becomes the master craftsman for his market segment that he defines, right? So you have to develop the craftsman's focus on a niche market. And once you've got the market in your pocket, once you've got the soft skills in your pocket, once you've got the hard skills under your belt, now <laughs> is the hard thing. You have to make the jump or you've got to take the plunge. And it is an irreversible um, change. Like, um, you know, so once you go ahead, <laughs> it can't go back. And so there is no looking back for an entrepreneur. And uh, you want to be an employee? Dogs live wonderful lives. But they eat the same food every day. It's always there at the same time and so on. But somebody else is the boss. Or do you want the freedom of a wolf? You know, one day you'll eat like a king. Next three days you're going to starve. <laughs> but, you know, you are, it's up to you to decide whether you want to hunt or you relax or you want to enjoy the, the moon. And so you have to decide, you know, whether you're going to be living a dog's life or the freedom of a wolf. And you have to get out of your comfort zone. Um, some of us got kicked out of a comfort zone. You find that your company laid you off or you find that your wife says, OK, I want you to start a company or your boss says that. But you get kicked out of the comfort zone. Uh, for me, it's happened in many, many different ways. There were times when, for some companies, I was kicked out of the comfort zone. Other companies, I was tired of the comfortable job, comfortable situation that I was in. But either way, you've got to be out of your comfort zone, where there is risk at every turn. And you'll say that, you know, I'll start a company tomorrow or next year or 10 years from now. The time is never right. As soon as you become passionate about something, that you're willing to give your everything to it, that's when the time is right. You know, don't start a company because if you're not passionate. So passion is really what is going to be most important for you. And the reason is that, as I said, entrepreneurs face problems all the time. And passion is what enables the entrepreneur to struggle on and persevere on in spite of all the odds. Because failure is not an option for an entrepreneur. They have to succeed. You know, who, nobody else is going to you know, save you or pay your salary or, or, or pay your employees their salary if you don't succeed, right? And uh, ultimately, entrepreneurs do it because they enjoy the journey. It's, entrepreneurs don't work for the IPO. They don't work for the M&A. They don't work for, you know, um, basically stock options. They work hard because they enjoy the journey. You have to enjoy the journey if you're going to be an entrepreneur who's going to enjoy the freedom of wolf and the success that comes from, and the happiness that comes from having your ideas take life and creating a company that has a life of its own. So wishing all of you the ability to enjoy the journey of an entrepreneur. Thank you.